friends. Welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel, evangelistnickgarrett.com. Check us out on the platforms at Evangelist Nick G. Today, I don't even know where to begin. It's interesting. We've been studying Eusebius. Last week, we did another video on the fallen angels, the Nephilim. We've been tying all these pieces together. A few weeks back, we had a video called Fake Jesus about uh, certain heresies in the early church uh, that involved sorcery. An individual named Simon Magus that is documented in the book of Acts. We learned in book three of Eusebius that Menander uh, was one of his pupils and that uh, apparently this line of teaching continued. It didn't end with Menander. Menander had pupils and two of those pupils would go on to develop two additional heresies that would be argued by Irenaeus and Justin Martyr in the early church. However, in studying this and in pondering the video we just made debunking the Sethite view, I got to thinking, okay, let's say I wanted to argue the Sethite view instead of the fallen angel view. Where would I find any ancient writings on Seth? Interestingly, where I had to look was Old Testament Apocrypha. And Seth played very heavily into Old Testament Apocrypha. So let me tie all these things together into a fascinating video that's going to take us further in the history of Eusebius. It's going to give us more about what the early church fathers had to say about the fallen angels. It's going to dig more layers down about the Sethite view. And it's going to share more about this movement of sorcerers that developed under Simon Magus and Menander. Sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? Well, hang on, because it's going to get very interesting. Let me start by catching us up. In book three and going into book four of the early church history by Eusebius, we learned that Jerusalem falling in 70 AD was only part of the picture, that for a long time, Romans and Jewish sects fought. Eventually, the Romans won, and they kicked out the remnants of the Jewish people, renamed the city, and from then on, Roman pagans lived there. As Judaism fell, Christianity began to gain its footing, although in different places and different ideas. We have to remember that Christianity was not developed from nowhere. It came from Judaism. We can look at the teachings of the Essenes, for example, and see that all they said was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So it's not like we take early church history and establish it from that point forward. No, that's why we have an Old Testament too. It's why it goes all the way back to the beginning. It's why the fallen angels and the Sethite view and all this tie into it. Let's start with chapter 7 in Eusebius' history. Read ahead a little and then I'm going to jump off. So as the churches throughout the world were now shining like the most brilliant stars and faith in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, was flourishing among the whole human race, there we have an example of Roman propaganda, obviously. It wasn't doing that well, but certainly we can take from that that the faith was alive. The demon who hates everything that is good and is always hostile to the truth and most bitterly opposed to the salvation of man turned all his arts against the church. In the beginning, he armed himself against it with external persecutions. But now, being shut off from the use of such means, remember, a few chapters back, we learned that some of the Roman emperors stopped the persecutions. So what's being said now is, hey, the enemies of the church, they no longer have the outside persecution as a means of getting to people, so now they're going to do it inside. Instigated by him, impostors and deceivers, assuming the name of our religion, brought to the depths of ruin such of the believers as they could win over. Think about the letters of Paul and the corrections he had to make to the various churches. That's an example. Accordingly, there proceeded from that Menander, whom we've already mentioned as a successor of Simon Magus, a certain serpent-like power, double-tongued and two-headed, which produced the leaders of two different heresies. Saturninus, of Antioch. We've heard of Saturnalia. We've heard about Christian Christmas stemming from pagan Saturnalia. We're not talking about that. This is actually quite different. 
and quite interesting. Saturninus, we're talking about the year 100 to about 120 AD. He was an early Gnostic, early heretic. Um, he's quoted in the works of Irenaeus, Tertullian, and um, Epiphanius. Uh, he was supposedly an apprentice of Menander, who had learned under Simon Magus, and he established a school in Antioch. Uh, Saturninus and uh, Basilides were among the two greatest students, and they started teaching these serpent heresies. They were Gnosticisms in Judaism. Listen to what they believed, though. Saturninus preached that matter itself was impure and that the world had been created by seven rebel angels known as planetary archons. Interesting tie here to fallen angels. The leader of these called themselves God, the God of the Jews, uh, the father of all. However, uh, he was tyrannical and those angels weren't the main satanic figure, but neutral entities. Unlike Simon and Menander, uh, Saturnalus was a dualist, and he kind of believed that God was opposed by equal principles that would be Satan. Um, and he makes reference to these demigod archons, right? We would know them in the Bible as fallen angels. Let me jump for a minute over to the Old Testament Apocrypha regarding Seth. Seth is recorded as the third son of Adam. He married his own sister called Aswam um, and begat Enos. Uh, Seth signifies resurrection in these writings. He's also called God because of the shining of his face, which lasted all his life. Moses also had this grace, and Enoch writes about Noah having this particular curiosity. Seth also prepared two pillars one in stone and one of brick. This is very interesting in the topic of Freemasonry because in Freemasonry, there are two pillars. In the Bible, we later learn about these two pillars when it comes to the Masons. So there's something very interesting there. So Seth, in these writings, is said to give names to the seven planets, seven planetary archons, fallen angels. This stuff's crazy, right? And remember that Simon and Menander had both originated in Samaria, and we found this strange deal about the two mountains with the curses and the blessings being yelled from the top. So there are certain statements about Seth that might be right. However, um, he's also in Hebrew letters that those angels talked to Seth and told him about the future transgressions that his sons were going to make. His sons being, allegedly, the watchers who were called the sons of God. And they told Seth concerning the flood that was coming and about the Savior. And allegedly, Seth had stayed with these Hebrew scholars for 40 days and then disappeared. But really, this seems like just assigning to Seth what belongs properly with Enoch as far as these types of prophecies and writings these same writings appear in Old Testament Apocrypha, but they're attributed to Enoch. So, interestingly, Seth and his line lived outside of Eden and communicated with these fallen angels that had built Earth, allegedly. But I want you to now think of what we've tied together. In the early church, we have heresies coming from Simon Magus and Menander that have to do with double-tongued serpent, the serpent from the garden, Nakash, deceiver. And they're actually using sorcery and magic. They are what spark Irenaeus and Justin Martyr to begin writing against heresies, whereas before what had been written was the documentation of the teachings of the apostles. We see that Saturninus, third in line from Simon Magus, taught about the belief of the seven fallen angels and one of them being the creator. Well, this ties to the Sumerian mythologies about Enki and Enlil and Archons. But then we get this Sethite tie. And just so you know, 
This was written, this Sethite document, right? I was curious to find something of Seth if I wanted to argue it. Comes from James Montague Rhodes in 1920 from a book called The Lost Apocrypha of the Old Testament. So ladies and gentlemen, this stuff is staggering and strange. Let's go on to see what Eusebius had to say about this. The former of these established schools of godless heresy in Syria, the latter in Alexandria. Irenaeus states that the false teaching of Saturninus agreed in most respects with that of Menander, but that Basilides, the other teacher under Menander, under the pretext of unspeakable mysteries, invented monstrous fables and carried the fictions of his impious heresy quite beyond bounds. But as there were at the time a great many members of the church who were fighting for the truth and defending apostolic and ecclesiastical doctrine with uncommon eloquence, so there were some also that furnished to posterity their writings as a means of defense against these heresies. So next we're going to get into Gnosticism, and I want to do that in a separate video. So let me close with this. How strange is this? The beginning of our Bible begins with the account of the serpent, the cursed serpent. Here we have our early church history. In Acts, we get slight references to Simon. We know he had a student, Menander. We know Menander had two students, Saturninus and Basilides, who Eusebius himself says carried on these sorcerer demon teachings. So in the early church, just like the early genealogies in the Bible, we have two trajectories happening. We have the truth of Christ, and we have the heresies going right along with it. We have the good and the bad. Look at Genesis chapter 4 and 5, where two lines, the Cain line and the Seth line, have people that are roughly the same name, living at slightly different times. This whole thing is so very strange. And we have further confirmation of the fallen angels in the teachings of these two heretics. But then we have ties to archons. Essentially different breeds, I guess, of angels or aliens or something. And it ties directly to the teachings out of Samaria and the mythologies of Mesopotamia about Enki and Enlil and the creation myths. And when we try to uphold this Sethite view that allegedly comes from scripture, all we find is more that points to the fallen angel view. Very interesting. That's all I'm going to say. All right, so next time we're going to get into a little bit about Gnosticism, and then we're going to get into the early ecclesiastical writers. Friends, if you can support us via PayPal, please do. We also have Cash App and Venmo, if they're easier for you. You could purchase one of the books we've written at Amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett. You can make a merch perch to support our work at our Teespring store. Visit evangelistnickgarrett.com to learn more about narrative apologetics and what we do. And most of all, watch the videos, like the videos, comment, share. All that stuff really helps to get around the algorithms or whatever it is that's shadow banning channels these days. Who knows? But God bless you, friends. Thank you for sticking around and listening to this strange story. I love you. And may your work today bear fruit. Thanks. Thanks.